Hello and welcome to today's lesson on stellar evolution, which is part of the astrophysics topic in AQAA level physics. So in today's lesson, we're going to look at how to draw the stellar cycle for stars larger than our sun. So if we've been successful and learned in today's lesson, we should be able to define the properties of supernovae and black holes, understand how gamma ray bursts occur in the universe, and understand how type 1a supernovae candles can be used as stellar candles. So this links into the follow part of the AQA A level physics specification 3.9.2.5, the Hirschsprung Russell diagram, and 3.9.2.6 supernovae, neutron stars, and black holes. So we can separate the stellar evolution of a star into different parts, which is revision from GCSE physics. Now, the beginning of a massive star's life cycle is very similar to that of an average star. The only difference is there is more matter present than in average stars. So the stages in which the star goes through until the a giant stage are identical. So a larger star starts with a nebulae of hydrogen gas. Stars like the Sun and larger stars are produced in the same nebulae. It's the density of the nebulae at particular points which determines the size of the stars. Now we start off with the larger nebulae at the beginning of a star's life cycle. Over time the gravitational force takes over and forms a sphere of a protostar. So over time the larger nebulae produce larger protostars to therefore this happens due to gravitational attraction condensing the hydrogen gas. This occurs as the nebulae is very cold and the gravitational attraction takes over, turning the gas into a sphere. This increases the temperature and pressure inside the protostar until the conditions are high enough to carry out hydrogen fusion. So we go from large nebulae to larger protostar. So what happens is eventually the temperature and pressure inside the protostar uh, continue to increase until they are high enough to carry out hydrogen fusion. When this happens, the protostar joins the main sequence. So at this point our protostar becomes a star. So when a star is carrying out hydrogen fusion it is in its main sequence. So you go from larger nebulae to larger protostar to massive main sequence star. So at this point the star moves on to the hirschsprung russell diagram in the main sequence section. Now it's placed up higher on the main sequence scale as it is brighter. Now when what happens is that when you get your hydrogen fusion in the main sequence it will only happen in the core of the star as this is the only place in the star which has a high enough temperature. Now a high temperature is needed for fusion so to overcome the repulsive forces of the positive hydrogen nuclei fusing. Now during the main sequence when this fusion takes place we know that the mass before is greater than the mass afterwards so when you produce a helium nucleus from the two hydrogen nuclei you lose some mass because some of the mass of the hydrogen turns into energy and this energy is released as electromagnetic radiation from the star. Now the principle which describes this is delta E equals delta mc squared. Now on your star there are two forces that act upon it. You've got the gravitational attraction produced by the mass of the particles in the star which acts inwards and the fusion pressure force produced by the products of fusion escaping the star which acts outwards. Now in the main sequence these two forces equal each other. This means there's no overall force on the star so the star remains stable in its main sequence. Now this shows that it's important to know that the greater the gravitational attraction in the star, the larger the star, the greater the fusion pressure needed to gain equilibrium. This means that larger stars have to have a greater rate of fusion compared to smaller stars. So larger stars have, have a greater rate of fusion so they spend less time on the main sequence than smaller stars. So this means larger stars in the universe spend a lot less time on the main sequence than our own sun. So what do we have so far? We've got a larger nebulae, larger protostar. Um, massive main sequence star however once the massive star hits the red giant stage its life becomes very different compared to an average star so when it hits the super red giant stage the star moves up to the red giant area of the diagram now we place on the furthest right of the group as it will be very bright now technically it could also belong to the blue hypergiant region but this is not covered at a level so what happens is when the hydrogen runs out the helium begins to fuse and this causes the star to expand to a red giant now originally the main sequence sequence star contracts as hydrogen fusion ceases and the gravitational attraction pushes the star in. This contraction increases the temperature of the core and helium fusion begins. This causes the expansion of the star to a red giant size. So in red giant fusion of elements larger than hydrogen takes place. Now it's important to note that because the fusion pressure outwards is larger because there are larger fragments pushing outwards this causes the star to increase in size and become a red giant. Now the temperature of a red giant is lower than the main sequence star 
as even though it produces a greater amount of energy, there is a greater area so the energy is more spread out. However, it's important to note that more energy is needed to fuse larger elements together as there's a greater repulsion between them. This is because larger elements have more protons to carry a greater positive charge. Now the energy in a star is shown by the temperature of the star. So in larger stars there's a great deal of energy because they have a very high temperature. So it means in the core the, the, the star has enough temperature and enough pressure to fuse all elements possible. So this means in larger stars at the red giant phase they can fuse to the most stable element iron. Now iron is the most stable element as has the largest binding energy per nucleon. This means that iron requires the most energy possible to remove a nucleon from its structure which is the most stable configuration of protons and neutrons possible. This means it's energetically unfavorable to fuse to elements larger than iron. So this means fusion to elements larger than iron does not occur. So when the star fuses to make iron, once that fuel has been depleted, fusion will stop. Now stars actually carry out shell fusion of elements in the red giant. So several fusion processes are taking place simultaneously. The fusion of heavier elements takes place in the core as this requires a larger pressure since the nuclei have a greater positive positive repulsion, whilst the fusion of lighter elements takes place in the outer layers as it requires a lower pressure since the nuclei have a smaller positive positive repulsion. Now, this leads to shells of elements forming in the red giants. So red giants are composed of shells of elements with the heaviest elements in the center and the lightest elements on the outside. So over time, the stars contract, heat, and then fuse successively bigger nuclei in the structure. So let's just clarify that when a star begins to run out of an element that it is fusing, it will decrease the fusion pressure force. This makes gravity the dominant force, which causes the star to contract slightly, as shown in the following diagram. So this increases the pressure and temperature of the star which then initiates the next fusion stage and this occurs in the center as this is where the highest temperatures and pressures are so it's important to know that this will increase the fusion pressure again which causes the star to expand so for a large red giant this can occur for many different elements now smaller red giant stars have temperatures and pressures which can fuse up to the element of carbon or oxygen but larger red giant stars have temperatures and pressures which can fuse all the way to the element of iron now fusion cannot occur above iron as up iron has the largest binding energy per nucleon of any nuclei in the universe. So for a large red giant you will have many layers of different elements. So the heavier elements are found in the core of the star and the lighter ones are found in the shells around the core. Now once you then have a un unopposed gravitational attraction when you have reached iron in your red giant this will cause a gravitational force which is inwards and is unopposed causing an implosion. This implosion increases the pressure and temperature of the core to produce a cataclysmic explosion. This explosion distributes all elements produced in the red giant stage into space to form a new nebulae and is called a supernova. So this then starts the stellar cycle again and the temperature at the core during a supernova is thought to be 100 billion kelvins. Now the shock wave and extremely high temperatures and pressures rapidly dissipate but are present for a long enough time to allow for a brief period during which production of elements heavier than iron occur Occurs. This is because the immense energy present in the supernova overcomes the decrease in nuclear stability. We believe that the supernova is the only conditions found in the universe where we believe elements larger than iron form. So we go from larger nebulae to larger proto star to massive main sequence star to super red giant to supernova. Now the supernova part of the stellar life cycle is not covered on the hertzsprung russell diagram. So to show you the enormous energy given off by a supernova, here is a star on the outer outskirts of the Andromeda galaxy going supernova. This one supernova is brighter than the entire Andromeda galaxy which consists of one trillion stars. This shows how much energy is expelled in a supernova. So when a star undergoes a supernova it will experience a brief and rapid increase in absolute magnitude. Now the energy of any output of a supernova is 10 to the 44 joules which is a number you must recall. Now this type of supernova is called a type 2 supernova. Now this is not the same as a type 1a supernova which is important because all type 1a supernovae have the same luminosity so we can use type 1a supernovae as standard candles. So the defining characteristic of a supernova is a rapid massive increase in absolute magnitude and therefore apparent magnitude and we can represent the change in absolute magnitude for a supernova with a light curve and this is a light curve for a type 1a supernova and you've got to be able to sketch and recall this graph 
graph for your examination. So there'll be a sharp initial peak followed by a gradual decreasing curve. Now you should also remember the axes values for absolute magnitude and time in this particular graph. Now all type 1a supernova undergo the same light curve. This is shown on the diagram as three separate supernovae follow the same pattern of absolute magnitude against time since the explosion of the supernova. So because all type 1a supernovae show the same peak in the absolute magnitude, they can be used as standard candles and that peak is minus 20 in the absolute magnitude scale. Very, very bright. So a type 1a supernova occurs when a white dwarf absorbs matter from a nearby binary star. This causes the white dwarf to explode as the explosion at the same level of mass absorbed uh, by the particular white dwarf is the same. So as a result, it produces identical light curves. So you can notice we've got a type 1 supernova and a type 2 supernova. So there are many types of supernova which each produce different light curves. So type 1 supernovae have no Balmer lines, so they've got no hydrogen absorption lines, but type 2 supernovae will have Balmer lines in its absorption spectrum. Now type 2 supernovae produce more energy than type 1 supernovae, and this energy takes the form of gamma rays, and we call it a gamma ray burst. Now gamma ray bursts can last for minutes or very rarely even hours. Now it's important to note that the type 1a super the type 2 supernova will produce these gamma ray bursts. So you can see in this particular image a gamma ray burst being hypothesized to come from a supernova explosion. Again you can see the following image of your gamma ray burst taking place from your supernova explosion. Now if a gamma ray burst occurred relatively close to the earth and was directed towards the earth it would destroy the ozone layer which would lead to a mass extinction event. So you are very fortunate that no uh, gamma ray burst has occurred close to the earth. Now when a supernova occurs you definitely create a new nebulae but there are two possibilities as to what else will form the first possibility is a core of neutrons a neutron star so a neutron star is a star which is comprised completely of neutrons. This means there is little empty space. The neutron has nuclear density, not atomic density. So this tells us that a neutron star has the same density of a nucleus, 4 times 10 to the 17 kilograms per meter cube, but it only has a diameter of 20 kilometers. This means the neutron star has a very high density, so it has an extremely large gravitational field. The speed to escape this field is very high, almost the speed of light. Now stars of neutrons form as neutrons are the most stable subatomic particle when in a large system, but they can't be completely compressed because the strong nuclear force becomes repulsive at 0.7 times 10 to the minus 15 meters, preventing from neutrons being completely crushed out of the universe. So this allows neutron stars to form by the principle of neutron degeneracy. Now as the neutron star is produced in a supernova explosion, it's got to conserve momentum. So to do this, many neutron stars rotate about the axes and they can rotate up to 600 times per second and when they do this the neutron star rotates and emits radio waves in a set of narrow beams. Now it occurs due to the interaction of the magnetic field with the um, with the rapid rotation of the neutron star leading to large electrical fields which accelerates particles to high energy which causes them to decay into radio waves and electron positron pairs. So as you can see here the neutron star if it is rotating will release that narrow beam of radio waves. So these radio waves can sweep past the earth in regular pulses and can be observed like flashes of a lighthouse. So these astronomical objects are called pulses. Now if the core of the compressed star is so large that its gravitational field is so strong, not even light can escape it, it is in fact a black hole. Now black holes of stellar mass are expected to form when very massive stars collapse at the end of their life cycle. So a black hole is a neutron star which is so massive and dense that its gravitational field does not let electromagnetic waves leave it. So nothing can escape it. So as nothing can leave the black hole, it appears black. So either a black hole or a neutron star is produced at the end of a larger star's life cycle. Now technically a black hole slowly evaporates over time due to Hawking radiation, but we can assume that it's theorized to exist until the end of the universe at A level. Now there are two sections to a black hole, the singularity which produces the gravitational well and the event horizon, the closest you can get to a black hole before you can no longer escape it. Now the distance between the two is called the Schwarzschild radius. So the Schwarzschild radius is the distance at which the escape velocity of an object is equal to the speed of light. It's the effective radius of a black hole. Now, 
Well, if we assume the mass of a black hole is found in the singularity, we say that V equals minus G over M, uh, G M over R, sorry. And this is the gravitational potential equation found in the gravitational fields topic. So therefore, the gravitational potential energy of an object with the mass inside a black hole is equal to EP equals MV, which again is a gravitational potential energy equation found in the gravitational fields topic. So therefore, the gravitational potential energy of an object in, of, with mass inside the black hole is E equals minus G big M small M over R. Now technically, the equation does not work in a strong gravitational field. You would need to use Einstein's theory of general relativity, but this is a bit too complex for A-level physics. So this means the objects will need to gain an energy of minus G M M over R. And this equation works to a good approximation. So therefore, to escape the black hole, you need the object to gain enough energy so that the gravitational potential energy equals zero and leaves the black hole. Therefore, to escape the black hole, the object needs to gain GMM over R of energy. Now, this energy needs to come from the kinetic energy as it's moving away from the black hole. So we can say kinetic energy equals gravitational potential energy, so a half mv squared equals GMM over R. So therefore, we can cancel these things through and rearrange it to find the Schwarzschild radius which is going to be equal to r equals 2 gm over c squared this will give you the schwarzschild radius of your black hole where r is measured in meters g is the gravitational constant measured in newtons per meter squared kilograms to minus two mass is the mass of the black hole in kilograms and c is the speed of light in a vacuum in meters per second now it's important that this equation is given to you in your examination book and derives the minimum distance between the singularity and the event horizon of the black hole the more more mass of the black hole, the greater the size of the black hole, as shown in this particular equation. Now we can actually have a picture of a black hole, as this is the first direct picture taken in 2019 with a series of radio telescopes hosted in one large net network. Now this ring shown in the picture is matter circling the black hole as it's entering it, which we call the photon sphere. Now this allows you to trace out the Schwarzschild radius of your black hole. Now it's important to note that when we consider black holes, that there is many galaxies with a supermassive black hole at their centre, which includes our own Milky Way galaxy which has a black hole, Sagittarius A, at its centre. So we can see our stellar evolution from larger nebulae to larger protostar to massive main sequence to super red giant to supernova, which will form a nebulae and a neutron star or a nebulae and a black hole. So we should hopefully be aware of the definer probabilistics of a, of a supernova, which include the rapid increase of absolute magnitude, we should also know the composition and density of neutron stars and the escape velocity must be greater than c for a black hole we should know that gamma ray bursts due to the collapse of a supergiant stars to form neutron stars or a black hole we should be able to compare the energy output of a supernova with the total energy output of the sun understand the use of type 1a supernova as standard candles to determine distances be familiar with the light curve of a typical type 1a supernova understand there are supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies and calculation of the radius of the event horizon of a black hole the Schwarzschild radius by doing 2gm over c squared. So if you've been successful and learned in today's lesson, you should be able to define the properties of supernovae and black holes, understand how gamma ray bursts occur in the universe, and understand how type 1a supernovae can be used as stellar candles. So I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson on stellar evolution, which is part of the astrophysics topic in AQA A-level physics. Thank you very much for watching, and as always, have a lovely day.